Hey everyone, it's Ben from Board to Bits, and welcome to part 10 of our series on making custom procedural meshes in Unity. So in this video, we're going to start diving into creating voxel-based objects, and we're going to get started with that. So in this video, we're going to dive into making voxel-based objects. We're going to start doing it a little bit of a simplified way, but first we need to do a little bit of cleanup here in our scene. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to rename our current scene that we're in because this has now become the cube mesh scene. I deleted the grid mesh, so I just want to rename this. I can do that by double clicking it. And we're just going to change this to be cube mesh. In addition, we're actually now going to create a completely new scene for our voxels so that we're not overwriting the cube that we already created. So I'm going to go up File, New Scene. And then I'm going to save this scene as voxel mesh. Now, voxels are basically a representation of some kind of data, typically arrays of integers or other classes and types, and then taking that array of information and rendering it as 3D cubes or sometimes other 3D shapes in the world space in your game. So we're going to need some kind of data in order to actually render something into our scene. So we're going to create a C-sharp script, and this is going to be called voxel data. We can jump into MonoDevelop with this script, and let's see if it initializes itself here. There it goes. Now what we can do, first thing we can do is we can actually delete this mono behavior. Inheritance up here, this is actually just going to be a strictly a data class. It does not actually appear as an object in our scene. We can also delete the uh, start and update functions since those no longer are relevant. And what this class is really only going to be responsible for storing is a multi-dimensional array of integers. And in this case, we're just going to go with a two-dimensional array. So we're really, in some ways, kind of doing similar to what we did with our grid of vertices, but now just with cubes. You can obviously do this with a three-dimensional array as well, where you have, you know, an X, a Y, and a Z. But because that gets a lot more complex, and typically in those cases, you're probably procedurally generating that kind of information or generating it through scripts in some way. Um, it's a lot, we're going to just stick with two dimensions because it's a lot easier for us to visualize right now. So I'm going to create an integer, and I'm going to do similar to our standard array, but I'm going to put one comma in it, which means that it has two dimensions to it. There'll be a, you know, kind of one on the left and one on the right whenever we're calling an integer from this array. And I'm going to just call this data. That's going to be equal to a new integer array. And then we can create this now. And you have to make sure you put this new integer array. You can't just start with brackets and start populating it. You have to put that in first, otherwise um, C Sharp doesn't know how to properly read it. And now how we're going to do this is we're going to have an array of three arrays. And I'm just going to do a three by three um, multi-dimensional array here. You can obviously do any number you want. Um, but like I said, again, kind of keep it relatively simple, but have enough data points that it's a little visually interesting. So the first one I'm going to do is actually going to be 0, 1, 1. So our top row, or our first row, has a 0 and then two 1s. And then the middle row will just be completely filled. So we'll say 1, 1, 1. And then lastly, we'll do 1, 1, 0. So we sort of have this square with but the two opposite corners are going to be empty. Then make sure you end with a semicolon. Now, in addition to this, right now we don't have any way of accessing this data because it's private to the class and there's no way to reference it. So I'm going to put in a few quick public um, helper functions here. A couple of property, actually two properties and then a function. So first we're going to do public int width. And what this is going to be responsible for doing is looking at this array and saying, how wide is it total? So I'm going to say return data dot get. Oh, when you're doing a property, make sure you say get return data dot get length. You could, when you use just um, 
a standard length, you can use that for a single dimensional array. But if you, in this case now, we have it could be this length or it could be this length. So we need to be able to um, specify which dimension. And these are um, zero indexed, so we'll say zero. We want that first dimension. Oops, just one there, and there we go. So this is actually getting us the one, two, three, this length, the three arrays within, or the three kind of, um, the three yeah, inner arrays, I guess you would call it. Now we're also gonna do a public int length. Uh, I'm actually gonna call this depth because this is gonna be a flat um, grid of cubes we're gonna make, kind of like it's as if it's the ground plane. And so um, it's gonna be on the X and the Z, which is traditionally the width and the depth, not um, height. So we'll say width and depth. And this one is going to be same idea, get return data dot get length, but it's going to be the next array. Now this one is measuring how wide is this. Now, because we're doing a multi-dimensional array in this way, we know that all of our internal arrays are the same length. You can also do what's called, um, sometimes it's called a ragged array, um, where you have different lengths inside, but because we're creating a grid, we want it to be all the same, so we're gonna use this style of multi-dimensional array. Um, oh, need to put our extra bracket there. Lastly, I'm going to get us a way that we can put in a couple of integers and get, so say I say, you know, we want 0, 1, we go to the 0 array and then number 1 here and get that proper um, integer that's in there. We could just make this public, but then we kind of open ourselves up to people, you know, being able to change our grid when we don't want them to, or, you know, accidentally creating a function that changes something when we don't want it to. So this is just really a way of kind of protecting our data a little bit. And so we're going to say public int get cell. And then this is going to ask for an integer x and an integer z. And once we provide those, we can simply return data x z. So that's all we need for our data. Now we need some way of kind of rendering this data into our scene. So we're gonna jump back over to Unity, double check that we don't have any errors, which we don't, looks good. I'm gonna create a new C-sharp script. And this one is going to be called voxel, we'll call it voxel render, because it's gonna be responsible for taking this data and rendering it, so it makes sense. We'll open this up in MonoDevelop, and if you don't have it open already, also open your procedural cube script because we're, we are gonna be taking a fair amount from that. Um, actually, in fact, what we're gonna do is we're going to copy all of this. So from using systems.collections.generic through the required components, we're gonna paste that in here. And we're also going to, we're gonna copy all of this all of the contents in here, all the guts, paste them in, but we are gonna change a couple things and I'll specify, but it's not that much that we're gonna be changing, so I'm gonna just do it this way and specify what actually is going to change. Save that. Now, the first thing I'm gonna get rid of is this public int position x, y, z. Um, that was useful when we were creating a single cube and we wanted to position it in a specific place, but now that we're doing it with voxels, the position within the data is going to be what determines the position. So we don't need to specify that. So we can delete that altogether. The other thing that we can do is we can delete what's inside of our, we can delete this make cube inside of our start function because we're no longer just making a single cube. Instead, we're going to create a mesh, create this voxel mesh instead, which isn't necessarily a cube. In our case, it's gonna be kind of like a, um, kind of like a flattened cube, but then with a couple corners missing. So it doesn't really make sense to even call it make cube at this point. We're gonna call this um, generate voxel mesh, in fact. And actually we're going to, um, yeah, and what this is going to need, we need to somehow pass this 
the voxel data that we have. Now, this could have come from many places in your game. This might be coming from a completely separate file that you have stored. It might be an XML file or something you're storing externally. It could be something, you know, you've built into the game. It could be something you've baked right into this class if you want. But to give it a little bit of flexibility, what we're going to do is once we call this, we're actually going to pass it in there so that we're not obliged to store it inside of the um, voxel render class. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to say new... Um, new voxel data and we're just going to use this default constructor um, even though we didn't create a default constructor inside of here there's that always exists for when you create a class it's part of kind of inherently part of C sharp and so what this will do is this will create this exact you know in a um, instance of this class for us still with this data so that will work the way we want it to now obviously we don't have this um, function created yet so we're going to make that right now say right down here we're gonna say void generate voxel mesh we want to make sure we ask for a voxel data parameter and we can just call that data and now in here is where we actually generate this um, generate the mesh and how we're gonna do this is we're gonna go through each point of our data grid that we have each point of the data within voxel data which we're passing here and we're going to say if it's zero don't do anything move on but if it's a one create a cube in the proper location and the easiest way for us to do this is to use a couple of for loops so we're going to create a first for loop tab tab fills out this but we're going to change the i to be a z and we're going to change the max is now going to be data dot width or data dot depth rather that's our z value and that's going to again give us that integer that is the the length of those um, internal arrays following this we're going to do another but this one's going to be with x for the value or for the um, uh, incremental integer and then data dot width so now we know we're going to iterate through every point in our data over the course of these two loops. Now we can simply check and say if data.getCell, we'll pass it our values for x and z. If it equals zero, then we can just continue. And what continue does is it breaks us out of this loop and will go to the next iteration in the loop. And if we're done with this particular loop, we'll go to the next iteration in this one. However, if, if this doesn't happen, then we're going to proceed to this next line right here. We're not breaking out of the loop. And so we can say, make cube. And remember here we have that scale, and we kept that adjusted scale. So we'll keep the adjusted scale here. And then putting it in the proper position is going to be a new vector3. And this is going to be our x value from our from our loop. I'm going to cast it to a float so that we can multiply it by our scale. So we'll say multiplied by scale. Y is just going to be zero right now because we don't have a y value in our grid. If we had a three-dimensional array, we would want to include the same idea but for the y value. And then float z times scale again. So lastly, let me close this. Uh, lastly, we can cut this from make cube, these two lines, because what these are doing every time we call make cube, it's resetting our mesh data um, back to um, an empty mesh. And we don't want to do that um, each time we make a cube, otherwise we'll only see the very last cube we made. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to cut that right here and paste it at the top of our general generate mox generate voxel mesh function so now when we first start creating the mesh we create a brand new um, a brand new mesh but not for every single cube we create so now we can clean this up a little bit save this so now back in unity we can create an empty game object I'm going to rename this 
voxel mesh. I'm going to add to it the voxel render component and we automatically get our mesh filter and our mesh renderer. Be sure to add here a material. We'll add the default diffuse material to our mesh renderer so it doesn't appear as just bright pink kind of placeholder pixels. And with that, we should be all set. We'll keep our scale to one for now, although we can adjust that if we want to. Save our scene and we can hit play and hopefully we will see a sort of a squat square appear here with a couple of chunks missing out of it. And there it is. Now, a little bit oddly, it does appear kind of shunted over to one side. Um, it's almost adding one to each pixel, or to each cube's side on the x value, but not the z value, which is interesting. I will investigate that quickly. But this is basically the idea of how you get um, your voxels to go from being data in an array to rendering into your world. Now, the reason I call this the easy way of creating voxels is because it's not exactly the right way. And the reason for this is if I go up to shaded and go to wireframe mode, you'll see that inside of our thing here, we have a lot of, there's like these triangles inside of here that you're seeing that are being rendered. And actually they're being rendered in two directions, but they're not ever, we're never gonna see those inside of here because they're, you know, covered by this surface here and this surface down here and, you know, surrounded by these walls. So we're really creating extra polygons that are not doing anything for our, um, for our visual experience, but are costing us processing and GPU power. So the better way to do this would be to take a look at each cube individually and say, which sides do I actually need to render? Which does take a little bit more effort, but is much more worthwhile in the long run. And so that's what we're gonna look at in our next video or two, where we actually build voxels the right way. In the meantime, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Hey guys, it's Ben from Board to Bits again. Just a quick end note here. The reason why our uh, voxels are appearing kind of shifted one space to the to the um, right is because I'd never actually reset the transform of my voxel mesh object and you see it's actually got an X of value of almost one there. It's actually a little bit higher and a little bit um, below the Z value as well. We can reset that to zero and now we should see that appears right in line with both of the axes here. So that was all that was uh, causing that. It wasn't anything in the code itself. So once again, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.